RubyConf. Welcome to Black Swan Events in Open Source, that time we broke the internet. We're coming to you today from the past as we recorded this talk last month. We're going to delve into complex socio-technical systems and how they interact with open source. I'm Julia Ferrioli. I'm a white woman with wavy brown hair wearing a gray and white flannel shirt. I've been working in or around open source for an unspecified number of years, focused on policy, sustainability, and everything else that needs to be done. I'm a bit of an open source archeologist because I dig around in data, stories, and source code with a fine tooth comb and enthusiasm. Hi, I'm Amanda Kasseri. I'm a white woman with short, light hair wearing a gray vest and striped shirt. And I'm fortunate that most recently my work is focused on understanding the nuances of open source, where it works, where it needs support, and where things are tucked away in the back room that we didn't know were holding up the internet. So we want to let you know that slides and speaker notes are available at this short link, which is bit.ly backslash black dash swan dash OSS. Now, before we jump into story time, Julie and I would like to level set with you on a few foundational concepts to make sure we're all on the same page. So first, we will have a very brief introduction to complexity theory. And this is the conceptual framework which defines complex systems. So complexity theory states that while complex systems are unpredictable, they are constrained by order generating rules. A complex system has components that interact in multiple ways, following local rules, with no unifying rule to define all interactions, but where the emergent system is greater than the sum of its parts. So after that, we wanna really look at a special kind of complex system, and that's a socio-technical system. In a socio-technical system, we have two new constraints to consider. Number one, the social and technical aspects of an organization are interrelated and cannot be isolated in analysis. And number two, we always have to account for the interactions between society's complex infrastructure and human behavior. So what does this have to do with open source? Well, we find that anyone who we've talked with who has worked at open source for more than a few weeks uh, will have some story about how open source has changed. And so looking back further, much, much further, uh, as we do in open source and in archaeology, we distinctly see where open source has evolved over time. So I'm going to do open source a grave injustice and highlight only a few events in its rich history. Initially, software was treated like it was in the public domain, traded back and forth between scientists and researchers. We hit a point in 1974 and a court ruling established that you could copyright code. The software community grew increasingly uneasy with this trend. And in 1989, the GPL version one was released, a pivotal point in open source history. We saw other milestones along the way, such as the term open source being coined by Christine Peterson and the open source definition, the OSD, being written under the auspices of the Open Source Initiative in 1998. The landscape changed once again with the advent of Git and GitHub in 2005 and 2008, respectively, making open source software and contributing to open source more accessible to more people. You no longer had to search mailing lists to find repositories or email patches around. What we see in open source history as a system that has undergone extensive evolution, and that evolution happens through disruption of norms. So given open sources evolution, what are some ways we can describe it? Well, it's a system, it's a distributed system, a cooperative system, a political one, a social, technical system, and an organic system. So if we look at the evolution, and we also look at all these individual layers of open source, we can start to see some really common patterns. We see that they have components that interact in multiple ways, following local rules, no unifying rule to define all interactions, and where the emergent system, open source, is greater than the sum of all of its parts. So we can confidently say that open source is a complex system. 
We can also say that if we want to understand open source and how it changes, we have to assume that open source is a socio-technical system. The human interactions and social components cannot be separated from the technical systems themselves. And this consideration is most important when disruptions happen, especially those which fundamentally change the ecosystem. And so sometimes a disruption to an ecosystem may be what we can call a black swan event, what makes these events so special. So there are three critical components of a black swan event that we have to consider for an, an event to be considered that when there is a disruption. And so black swan events ultimately disrupt the status quo, cause systemic change, seem inevitable in hindsight. And so with we would like to use all of that information to identify three specific events in the history of open source, which highlight the complex socio-technical nature of our evolving ecosystem. And to do this, we first have to go all the way back to 1988. And so in 1988, there are about 60,000 computers, give or take, uh, networked together to form the public internet. While there were an, increasingly number, an increasing number of industry networks all selling the power of connection in the workplace, a majority of these computers were government or academic systems. And the Morris worm, or the worm, as it's commonly known, uh, was created and inadvertently. And the asterisk in this sentence indicates that there is a point that is a little contentious, but we all agree to, to in order to be congenial people in this setting. Um, so the Morris worm was created and inadvertently released by Robert Taplin Morris. And when Morris was a student at Cornell, um, he released the worm via a system in MIT in order to prevent it from being traced back to him as part of a research project examining internet systems and how their open, up, open protocols could be exploited. And this worked much quicker than Morris expected by exploiting multiple operating system vulnerabilities and most importantly, the transitive trust that existed at that time between system admins and users, the Morris worm infected about 10% of the global internet in a matter of days. Now, there are many notable firsts from this event, among which is being the first computer worm to be distributed via the internet, as opposed to traded via floppy disks or removable media. And also, Morris was the first felony conviction in the US from the 1986 Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, so, but why does this one event matter to open source and how is it a black swan event? So using our magical glasses of hindsight, we can clearly see where the status quo has changed and the influences in how we operate today. First of all, we do not assume that everyone is operating in, in everyone else's best interest. This event happened in November 1988, and that was just months before GPL and Linux were released for the first time. And we cannot ignore the human interests, community expectations, and social trust that existed at the time of the, these releases, all of which were fundamentally impacted by the Morris worm just months before. Uh, the reaction to and the recovery from the Morris Worm also demonstrated the robustness of the internet when it was designed as a partitionable and distributed system, which prioritized open knowledge sharing. So Morris quickly worked to move fixes to the worm onto multiple mailing lists. Unfortunately, some of those actions were actually delayed because of the effectiveness of the worm, but system administrators did work together very well to isolate the damage and prevent impacted systems from infecting farther systems. So because of the Morris worm, the internet and software, which it runs on, has changed. We've had a pivot in security regulation and international laws. Uh, we didn't want all systems to look alike anymore. Super homogeneity was seen as a risk at this time rather than as efficiency, which is what it was previously. There was also this hard lean, especially in industry and government, to move to proprietary systems and contracts. And also, because of the exploit the Morris worm used to access systems without logins, you and me now have to remember all the passwords. And so speaking of black swan events that sound like security and open source, Julia. No, not my passwords. <laughs> so we're going to jump forward just a tad to 2014 and talk about Heartbleed. Heartbleed is one of my favorite examples when talking about open source as a complex socio-technical system. Heartbleed was first released, or rather first exploited, it's not a product launch, launch after all, in 2012, but it was only publicly disclosed two years later in 2014. What was Heartbleed? Well, it was an issue with the most popular open source cryptography library called OpenSSL. Essentially, it made user entered data vulnerable to being captured by malicious third parties. With that data combined with also exposing cookies and passwords, bad actors could impersonate users, 
compromising even more information and even more security. Heartbleed affected a variety of systems, including everything from phone systems to payment processors to gaming services to most websites. Given that Apache and Nginx servers were both susceptible to Heartbleed, it affected at a minimum 66% of the internet, including government databases that held personally identifiable information. Heartbleed was definitely a black swan event in the history of open source. Why? Well, it drew attention to the fact that while open source is distributed, maintainership doesn't have to be, and in many cases, isn't. Very few people realized beforehand that OpenSSL was primarily maintained by one or two people and maintained entirely on a volunteer basis. While an argument often made in favor of open source is that many eyes make all bugs shallow, the fact of the matter is that a maintainer's time can be extraordinarily limited. In OpenSSL's case, the maintainer didn't have enough time, given their job, to mitigate Heartbleed. Heartbleed really highlighted that while at its core, open source is about software or hardware, open source cannot function without supporting the people behind it. As a result of Heartbleed, donations came pouring in to allow core maintainers to work full-time on OpenSSL. It also increased interest in open source sustainability, supply chain analysis, and prompted more tooling to support both. Even more companies that relied upon open source saw sponsored development and open source contributions as an investment in their own stability, founding and funding the core infrastructure initiative amongst others in response. Yeah, Heartbleed is a classic example of a black swan event, and it's because of the complex socio-technical factors that led to it. Pass it off to Amanda. Thanks, Julia. And so finally, we'd like to uh, highlight the impact from event in 2016. So even a little more recently, but not quite to modern day, uh, which continues to be discussed and felt by folks who are working at open source package management, the platforms they depend on, and the people whose work they share. And so the quick story of LeftPad was that everything started as a trademark disagreement over an NPM package name. Important to note, the package name was not LeftPad. It's actually a completely different package. So the way that the node package management system works, some maintainers maintain many packages, not just one. And so when this package manager found that they lost the dispute over the trademark agreement, because NPM ultimately ended up siding with the trademark holder, uh, the developer decided to delete all of his NPM packages, including LeftPad. And so I do want to point out here that that was within the developer's right. Uh, the developer has uh, is able to maintain their own work. Um, so removing things from a larger system is actually within the rights of the creator. Uh, and in this case, no but, and LeftPad was a transitive dependency for many other packages, which caused widespread cascading failures across the internet. So many packages within Node had been created using LeftPad as a transitive dependency. And so a lot of websites that used any form of Node didn't work when LeftPad was pulled from NPM. And NPM decided to restore the unpublished package without the developer's consent in order to keep things moving because they were in fact a company who had to make sure that the customers were able to get the service that they needed. And so how is this something that is impacting open source in a black swan event? So we can see very clearly with our hindsight glasses that yes, unpublished code and releases are perfectly legal to remove. Uh, you can unpublish code and releases under open source terms. And uh, as Julia's done also some recent polling and some analysis and discussion on, this also means that there is some uh, nuances around here of when you are creating things and building it as part of a larger ecosystem. And the question there becomes, what is it that we owe to each other as well as it, what is our personal rights and what do we owe to ourselves? 
And so we want to also make sure we point out as part of the impact of open source that it is the Node.js development philosophy that did lead to decreased awareness of dependency complexity in this point because of the distributed and the complex nature of Node.js uh, where the packages are all of these tiny little packages which may not understand how they emerge as part of a larger whole. This did in fact create a system where cascading failures could happen. Um, so what changed as a result of this? We do have, especially since 2016, increased visibility to the cost of maintainer burnout. You'd think that this was something we would have learned back in 2014 when we started seeing these criticalities happen with one maintainer as a part of a critical project. But now we have started to also look at this, not just from a monetary perspective where things start to get layered as well in the economics of different package management systems, but also what does it mean for somebody just to decide that they're done? What's the appropriate way or ways that we can call to be responsible, to be ethical, to be um, something where it is within people's rights to be able to say, I'm done, I'm not done, I don't wanna be part of this anymore. Um, and so this is an increased discussion these days about maintainer rights and open source contractualism. Um, there's also additional scrutiny around privately run package managers for open source software. So there's been a lot more discussion around the economics of open source, the ways that we depend on critical infrastructure and what is critical infrastructure. So those are our three events, but how did we find all of this information? There's not actually a centralized repository that covers technical and social aspects. Well, I did mention that I'm a bit of an archeologist, so I broke out my brushes and shovels and we did some old fashioned manual research and cross-referencing. The internet archive is a treasure trove of information and various news articles contain snippets of detail here and there. CVEs are definitely helpful, but don't necessarily tell the whole story, especially the social side of it. We also learn, leaned on our own experiences in open source, but we still miss the human experience besides our own anyway. And that brings us to a new project that we call Open Source Stories which you can see today on opensourcestories.org. This project is about collecting oral histories and stories of open source, as well as the people behind them. Everything that makes up open source from design to docs, to engineering, to community management is fair game. We hope to ca capture a variety of experiences from everyone who makes up this vast open source ecosystem, as well as documenting pivotal points in open source history. It is something that Amanda and I have been talking about for ages now, wishing that this repository of narratives existed, so we decided to make it. It's definitely a labor of love. And as with any good project announcement, we want to share where we are now and where we want to be. And so there is a website, opensourcestories.org, uh, which also has a component in StoryCorps. So if you haven't heard of StoryCorps, StoryCorps is a nonprofit in the U.S. Uh, which is trying to just capture conversations, lived experiences and narrative histories uh, through shared experiences between two people. And so they have an app and they have a website, but most importantly, they take all of these experiences and conversations and they archive them in the US Library of Congress. So this now becomes not just a story and a narrative, but documented history. Uh, and that's really where Julie and I hope to go with this is that this just doesn't become a project that lives in the ephemeral, but also becomes the recorded history of so many people who currently are not being the center of the story. Um, so we do have some first stories published on opensourcestories.org backslash stories. Um, in the future, we would really love to allow self-directed storytelling for people who wanna contribute their stories um, that doesn't have a facilitator present, if that's not always possible. Um, but we also would like to onboard new facilitators. So for this project, a facilitator would be somebody who would have a conversation with somebody else with a story to tell. Um, we would like to expand the question list that facilitators and people interact with so that we have ways to kind of guide conversations along. And also we want to share all of these stories um, with everybody here and in the rest of the world. And so in order to do that, we have some ways that you can contribute right now with hashtag open source stories. Um, so you can tell your open source story. You can volunteer to tell your story. Um, you can contribute to the website. That would be greatly appreciated. We have, if you are on open source stories on GitHub, you will see 
uh, the ways that you can contribute as part of our contributions page. One key piece of this, which I would like to really highlight here, is that editing transcripts and copy from recorded conversations is a very time heavy task as a part of this loop. So being able to take the recorded conversations, running them through a transcription protocol, checking through the script, correcting everything that needs to happen, and then working with somebody on that to make sure it matches their words and do translations, if this is your jam, would be most appreciated because we would love for these not just to be audio files, but also to be transcripts that work with people of all needs. Um, and the last piece like we had said, or I had said earlier, becoming a storytelling facilitator, Right now, it's Julia and I as of this recording date. Um, and so we would love for more people to join, uh, join the club and become a facilitator, talk with somebody else. If you miss seeing people in person, this is a great way to have a casual yet interesting conversation with somebody who maybe you've never met before. We've done a few and they are really fun. They're so I highly fun. recommend it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so if you are interested in any of the references that we talked about in the slides, once again, these slides are available at bit.ly backslash black dash swan dash OSS. Um, we also have some other links here in the slide um, that give you information about StoryCorps, open source stories, socio-technical theory, black swan's definition. And most excitingly for me is the simplified OSS timeline that Julia built which you can get at bit.ly backslash simple dash OSS dash timeline. And you can contribute to it as well. So please do. Yeah. <laughs> and with that, we will wrap up and say thank you and go back to our live selves for some Q&A if we have time. Hi, teacher Amanda and Julia. Thank you all.